Good morning and welcome to this webinar on uh, an introduction to integrated care and support planning. My name is Jo Harvey and currently I lead on uh, the work that Helen Sanderson Associates is doing with the integrated um, personal commissioning program that is being run by NHS England, which is where uh, most of my work around integrating care and support planning is actually happening. Hopefully, if you, um, you may have some experience with this, you've heard of some of this, but I did want to start by giving a little bit of context to that program because I feel that that would be um, really relevant. So hopefully that will be useful for people to hear. If you've come to the webinar today hoping to see an example of an integrated care and support plan or a template that's being used, I'm afraid you won't get that because there isn't such a thing um, in being yet. There are templates that different uh, sites are using, but there is no standardized approach to care and support planning. And in some ways, on a formal basis, this is really, really early on in the journey. But what I will share is some information that is happening uh, um, about some work that's happening at a national level, which um, is focused on this integrated care and support planning and, and making sure that's personalized. So hopefully uh, that makes some sense. So I'm going to start with just um, using some slides that come directly from the IPC or Integrated Personal Commissioning Program. So the NHS England slide here, which I have permission to share with people. So the um, Integrated Personal Commissioning Program is a program that's been in place just about a year now, actually, and um, is one of the pillars of the five-year forward view, which was published uh, around 18 months plus now ago. And the, um, what IPC is really trying to achieve is to work with people who have complex needs and really, in many ways, for whom the, the system is not working. Okay, So particularly focused on that group of people where maybe they're having a lot of crises, a lot of un unplanned admissions to hospital or into some form of care. And the program is really about uh, offering them uh, greater involvement in their care and particularly being able to design the support that they need that meets their very specific needs. So having a much more, a much more control and involvement in that really, which it is hoped will lead to a, a kind of a prevention of those kind of crises and unplanned uh, hospital admissions really. And I, can't, I guess the real focus of that is, is, a, is about better integration. I think at the front line for, for individuals, they perhaps maybe somebody new to the system doesn't particularly understand why that's not possible. Uh, maybe doesn't understand the kind of silos that we are often working within health and social care and even education because uh, it makes absolute sense to the person for that to be wrapped around the person rather than lots of different areas. My 19-year-old daughter um, is recently in receipt of services from social care, but she also receives some services uh, from health and doesn't understand as somebody new to the system why it can't be all connected up. And really that's what this program is try trying to achieve and at the heart of that is that care and support planning process and the need for that to be integrated as well. So that's briefly what IPC is about. So um, in terms of the program, there are nine demonstrator sites uh, currently who've been working for a year. So they went through quite a rigorous application process and um, they've been working now for a year on uh, beginning this piece of work really and it's a three year program so there's another two years to go. Um, there are going to be a second wave of demonstrator sites coming online within the next few months that will take the learning from the first group and uh, begin that process as well. So um, as you can see here um, from the slide, Stockton on Tees, Barnsley, Cheshire West and Chester, Lincolnshire, Luton, Tower Hamlets, the whole of the southwest almost, um, with, that's a, um, a consortium. Uh, Hampshire and Portsmouth. 
um, and each each program, each demonstrator site is um, working with uh, the CCGs that are relevant in their area, so that may be more than one, certainly in the southwest that is obviously as a consortium, and in partnership with their local authorities um, to look at this um, process uh, as a whole. And what you can see um, written down against each of the sites is the areas or the cohort, as it's usually described within the program, of people that um, they are particularly focused on testing out this idea of integration as well. So for Stockton, it's people with multiple long-term conditions. So in their first phase, for example, they've been working with people with complex COPD. Uh, Barnsley, people with complex diabetes. Uh, Cheshire West and Chester are focused on children and adults with learning disabilities, Lincolnshire, people with dementia and actually this is an addition and people with a learning disability, Luton, people with dementia, then people with a learning disability, uh, Tower Hamlets, uh, people with significant mental health and social care needs and children with complex needs. South West as a large consortium is looking at all groups, so anybody who has a complex um, set of needs really in complex conditions, more than one or multiple long-term conditions. Um, Hampshire is focused on children and adults with learning disabilities and Portsmouth older people with multiple long-term conditions. So that's just, so each of those nine demonstrator sites is uh, working with the national team and um, a group of uh, voluntary and community sector partners that have been commissioned to support each of the sites. There's about 25 of those um, as well. So um, there's some really emerging work now from the first year, and I'll, and I'll show you a summary of that in just a minute. But they, the five key shifts of IPC um, are, are detailed here, and I'll just touch base on those really. So. In terms of an individual, what they're hoping uh, an individual will see as a shift in services, that there is a proactive approach to uh, really improving people's experience of care and preventing crisis rather than that constantly being reactive. So trying to look at a proactive approach around that. Um, it's around having a different conversation with people involved in, in somebody's care and that's being focused on what's important to, to you. And obviously that's the bit where integrated care and support planning really, really fits in. A shift in control over the resources available to somebody. So that's at the ultimate degree of control. That would be around budget. So whether that's an integrated budget, whether um, including health, social care and for children, and young people, uh, education funding as well. But it is also trying to look at resources in its widest sense, so not just thinking about budgets, but thinking wider than that. It's about a community, um, building that kind of community focus really and looking at peer support within the community that helps people build their kind of knowledge and their confidence uh, really. And then it's about, um, having a wider choice really of options around uh, care and support uh, within the market so people have different things to choose from, flexible options to choose from that specifically meet their needs. So that's the shifts that uh, the IPC program is looking at seeing to be able to deliver kind of real integration. So this was some um, a graphic newly published uh, just last month, so a couple of weeks ago really. So it's taken each of the key shifts on the left that I've just described and what the first year's work has shown is that in order to deliver on those key shifts and achieve the outcomes I described on the first slide, which are right over on the right, this middle section, there are some distinct changes that need to take place within services to be able to deliver on those key shifts. And that's the really main focus over the next year of the nine demonstrator sites. And also in addition to that, some centralized collaborative teams that are working on each of these service components. So I'll just work through the service components and then I'll mention those collaborative uh, groups really. So in order to be able to deliver on this kind of proactive, coordinated care, um, the, the service component, 
component that is being worked on is being able to um, generate um, costings at the person level. So for each individual, they will be um, aware through an individual statement of resources about the kind of resources that are available to them, whether that's um, broken down into personal or budget or um, or personal health budget or you know a, a budget as such but also looking at the other kind of resources that may be available to them um, to deliver on the community capacity and peer support um, then the service component is is looking at how within a local area there is a very coordinated low level of community and peer support and that that is routinely offered to people. So it's really about building that capacity within the community to be able to deliver that on a routine basis. And then that becomes part of the support that people receive even um, which may be um, all of that they receive or it may be Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to begin the presentation, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel to allow all attendees to hear you. This system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. Patients can be activated, so how are we supporting people to self-manage as much as they can, really, and then using that to measure uh, how successful the support has been. Uh, in order for people to have choice and control, then we need to look at integrated personal budgets um, that are, have a blend of health, social care and education, rather than those two working in very separate silos, as I mentioned um, before. Um, and then the last one is looking at um, commissioning, really, and how um, uh, changes might need to be made to the contracting process, the payment process, um, that incentivizes um, more personalized care. So where people don't have full control over money because that's not possible in terms of the services that they uh, need to use cannot be broken down at this point into um, to give people a budget that they have direct control over. It's thinking about if that's not possible, how can we ensure that the care that is offered by uh, provider organizations is more personalized? And how can commissioning incentivize that through the use of things like sequins uh, to be able to um, ensure that even the services that people don't have direct control over through a budget are more personalized? So in terms of those service components, what the uh, program has been doing has been, um, there have been five collaborative development groups that are now working, and they have a 12-month window, and that started around the end of April, beginning of May, uh, a 12-month window to develop some uh, what's known as standard replicable models. So. Um, around each of those components, those service components. So that's looking at being able to kind of look at the common approaches. So I, I sit on the care and support plan, personalized care and support planning collaborative development group. So what we're looking at there is a framework, and I'm going to go on and tell you about this. We're looking at a framework that allows people to um, understand what's going to really help put into place personalized care and support planning, and actually what can get in the way of that as well. So we're looking at a frame, framework rather than saying, here's a template, you have to do it this way. And it's and the idea that each of these groups will be able to de develop a model that can be taken, it will be tested within the demonstrator sites and within the new demonstrator sites that will come on online. Um, and then that the idea is that that can accelerate um, implementation across a much wider um, group of people across the country, really, um, and kind of reduce the duplication. So if a CCG and local authority come together, 
much later on and say, we're going to have a go at this integration stuff, there's some really clear replicable models that they can take on board and implement rather than starting to reinvent the wheel all over again. So it's a real, as I said, 12 months from April onwards, rapid sort of development of that model, testing it and refining it over that 12-month period. So that's the work that, that's happening really. Um, they're the different um, CDGs, or collaborative development groups. Uh, they each have a coordinator that is from the national central IPC team at NHS England. Um, they have a co-chair who will be from one of the nine sites and then they have voluntary and community sector partners involved in each one. Um, and so they're merrily working away at the moment. So for example, in the person-centered care and support planning, we've had two meetings and we meet or talk monthly, well actually probably about three or four, yeah, three weekly uh, at this moment in time. So what does that all mean for good care and support planning? That's the, the key uh, part to this. So I'm going to drill down into that work uh, a bit more, having set that context really. So whenever um, I'm talking about care and support planning within um, uh, the IPC world and uh, thinking about it in an integrated way, there are some things that I, I'm, I start off by using as a bit of a guide really. So the first thing is, is to reference um, the work that ha was done by the National Co-Production Advisory Group um, and they did this piece of work for um, TLAP, Think Act, uh, um, Think Act um, Think Local Act Personal, that's what I was trying to say, and the Coalition for Collaborative Care. So this is a guide to what good care and support planning actually looks like and it's based on the experiences of real um, uh, a real lived experience uh, by people who have a personal budget and also uh, working alongside uh, commissioners of services as well. This is just a graphic from that guide and uh, you can find that guide uh, on the TLAP website and it just talks about what people want from a good care and support planning process and um, this was originally written with uh, pers personal budgets in mind but these principles hold whether you're talking about a single kind of funding stream or whether you're looking at integrated really. So I always start by sharing these because I think it's really important. So just very briefly to go through them, this is what people want. They want to be trusted to write their own care and support plan with whatever help they want. They want their care and support plan and that this counts for integrated plans as well to be about the whole of their life, not just about assess, assess needs or money. They want to be encouraged to uh, and supported to think creatively about different ways to achieve outcomes. So not having restrictions and lists about uh, what you can and can't uh, spend money on. If I need help to plan, I can choose who supports me through the process and to put the plan into practice. So some real choice around who might support somebody. That the people who are supporting Supporting uh, somebody to plan, have a flexible, open, honest, positive, solution-focused attitude. That they can involve family and friends if they choose. That they have all the information needed to plan. That it's delivered in an accessible way and, and that includes signposting to what's available locally. The, the, the per, that somebody's supported to take risks and they know it's okay to make mistakes and change their mind. That the process from assessment through to review is transparent and clear. Um, I know what to expect and when to expect it and people do what they say. And the review is person-centred on me and my life, my outcomes and what is working, not working. It's not just about an audit of the money. And actually, um, in addition, that the review is a way to contribute your views to improving the system as well. So there's some principles that I think we need to always bear in mind when we're talking about care and support planning and in this case integrated care and support planning. So right at the beginning of the, uh, and don't worry about trying to read those cards because I'm going to uh, explain each of them in detail, but right at the beginning of this um, process of um, the IPC work, 
uh, a group of people got together to uh, look at developing a framework for integrated care and support planning and uh, this is the framework that has been developed and as I said I'm going to walk you uh, through each of these sections in just a minute and this is based around and this was what was designed um, this tool that you can find on the um, TLAP website under personalized care and support planning tool I think you'll find and as you can see it has a uh, different section so there's just a slight difference in what I showed you there which has um, these the um, five sections and this one which has an additional section of context because that is just setting um, the context and the work of the collaborative development group is focused around this model and uh, what needs to be in place to help and hinder people, practitioners, and the system to be able to deliver on this model. So it's at its basis is this model of have, uh, being really clear about the context. I'm just going to dive into the preparation conversation record, record uh, making it happen, and uh, review sections in, in particular. But do go and look at that uh, tool online. What you'll find online. Uh, when you look at that tool on the TLAP website is there are different um, stories really so there's about six different individuals uh, who have a different a range of different needs from uh, complex long-term conditions to people who use mental health services to a young person uh, with special educational needs a gentleman with dementia and you can click on a story that feels relevant to you or an individual that feels relevant to you and then you can walk through their preparation, their conversation, their recording, making it happen and review just to explore this process. So it's a great tool to go and have a look at. So I'm going to dive into each of the sec sections. I normally do this on a, on a pin board so um, I try to replicate that uh, a little bit. So thinking about prepare, what we're saying is if you do not prepare people to have a care planning, uh, care and support planning um, experience, then you will not you will not have active participants. You will have passive recipients of, of care and support planning. And what we're looking for in this process in great care and support planning is that people are active participants where they can be. If they're not able to be through capacity issues, then it's working with those people that know somebody really well. And you need them to be active participants just as, as, as much as you would the person if they were able to be. So a real key to that active participation is preparation. So for the process, when this process was developed, the group of people that developed it said, actually, there's three areas that we need to be preparing people for process, preparing the person for the actual conversation they're going to have, and preparing practitioners. So in terms, of, I'm going to take each of those um, in turn. So for the process, um, people need to understand what the process is and why it's happening. So that it's that contextual information. They need to know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Um, they need to know and be able to tell us, actually, how they want their information shared. So where it's got to be shared amongst different practitioners, it's up to, the, to the, the, uh, a, a practitioner here walking through this preparation with the person to ask the person and understand that, really. So looking at decision-making with them and how they might process that. Um, who to involve. It's really important that the person is able to say, these are the people I want involved because these are the people that know me really well. And it may be there are certain people that have to be involved depending on, on the needs that somebody has. So it's just making sure we're really clear about that um, at the start of the process. And then how the person's going to be kept at the centre. So what support do they need around decision making? What is it that people need to know? To, to provide them with the best information to make decisions. And if somebody isn't able to make those decisions for themselves, how will we still keep their voice at the centre of this process as well? So that's the prep st stuff around process. Then it's about preparing the person. They are going to go on and have a what, what's described as the what matters conversation. 
And if you just dive straight into that, it's really hard sometimes to, to think about how, um, you know, the answer to some of the questions that you'll see in the next section. So actually what we know at a minimum, if you ask people to be, be thinking about, and they don't need to just explain it at this point in the conversation, it's just ask them to think about what matters to you, what future aspirations they might have, and what is working and not working in their life right now. And that means that they will be more prepared. So the planning that we've been doing in a number of the sites, we've been doing that in different ways. So we've been doing that through live planning sessions and direct one-to-one -one planning. And each time it's about having a preparation conversation. And we've also developed a preparation booklet that just gives people some key questions to have thought about before they get to their planning conversation. And we know that is something that really helps. Um, but it's also really important that the practitioner is ready for this as well, because for some practitioners, this is working in a different way. This is a different type of conversation. Um, and also, um, so these are the things that we think it's really important for practitioners to do in preparation. So for them to do their own working and not working about the person's life, what is it that they um, uh, think is working and not working right now about somebody's health and sort of situation and whole life really. Um, to have prepared and shared any information that is relevant to the conversation, the planning conversation. So that's things like um, making sure tests are completed and that information has been shared. Um, it's also important to establish if people are going to be eligible for different types of uh, funding, so health and social care, education funding, that, that is, uh, eligibility has been established. So doing that preparation work and making sure that's been established. So that is the preparation stage. Okay, And as I said, the collaborative development group is working on uh, ensuring um, to provide a framework to show what helps and hinders at this stage and at each of these stages. So then I want to go on to the what matters conversation. Okay, so the what matters conversation has a number of different things and these are in order. So the order that you can see me talking about these uh, is the order in which we would have this conversation. So it's starting with what is important to the person, what is important to you. Uh, establishing that. It's then looking at what is working and not working in their life right now. Specifically around their health is really important, but you can look broadly um, at that. Um, some people find it uh, useful to link that to areas of eligibility, so you could work through areas of eligibility if somebody is eligible for continuing health care or somebody's eligible for uh, social care, so look at the eligibility outcomes under the CARE Act and ask what is working, not working. There is no rules around this, it's the, the only one being you ask what is working and not working because it is a great way to get a picture, it's a great way to understand things that people want to change and it's a great way to move on to outcomes then. Uh, but you can use almost subheadings as a framework to help people to think through that as well. It's about asking people about their future aspirations. Uh, even when we are working with people who are at the end of their lives, I still think this is a question that you can ask. So what do people uh, want to aspire to? Some people really struggle with this, so you might want to keep a tight, a really sort of a, a, um, a time frame that's six months. It might be a year, it might be five years, but it's what's going to work for the person really to explore that. And there's lots of different tools and questions that you can um, ask around that. Um, you, you need to explore within this uh, planning conversation any test or assessment information that has been undertaken that is relevant to the planning conversation. So working with people with complex diabetes, before they get to a planning conversation, a care planning conversation, they should have had their probably most up-to-date HbA1c, which is the blood test that shows people's blood sugar levels over a three-month period. That's a great bit of information to have when you come to um, a, a care planning conversation because you have the most up-to-date information. It's then looking at the resources that are available to people. So this individual statement of resources, so the likely resources that are available, uh, looking at 
budgets where that's relevant to people, but what are the resources that they already have? It's then looking at some of the options that they've already tried to. It says explore options here, and that is because it's looking at what's already been tried. So what have you tried? What have you learned from what you've tried? What are you pleased about? What are you concerned about? Is a useful, we call that a four plus, though it's only four plus, uh, not the plus one, it's the four questions, but tried, learned, pleased, concerned about. So it's understanding what somebody's already done before we sort of dive into the outcomes. And then I use, the next step is to develop really good outcomes. And so essential in an integrated care and support plan is a really clear section on outcomes. And I think that's really um, important to see. Um, and the outcomes for me, they come from looking at the working, not working. So it's thinking about for the things Things that are working, is there any outcomes that we need in place that will help maintain that? Or sometimes that's an action really more than an outcome. But then looking at the not working and then using that as a basis to develop outcomes to address those issues. Um, from your outcomes, you'll come up with your solutions, your next steps, your actions around that. Um, and then it's really important that you look at contingency and crisis management, and that's a, a key part in the plan, particularly as, you know, in this process of integrated care and support planning, it is focused on people with really complex needs. So it's, it's looking at what contingencies need to be in place and, and that being really clearly outlined in a care and support plan. And then the last thing is to have a conversation about what review looks like. So statutory guidelines for review don't change and they will be relevant to the parts of the service that people are accessing. But it is really important as part of that conversation to understand what review looks like specifically for this individual. Because it might be if they're trying out some new, relatively untested, creative solution to meeting an outcome that you want to take a more informal approach to review um, you know, over the first couple of months. Um, and so that's really important to have that kind of conversation about certain aspects of a care and support plan as well. Then you get onto the recording it. And the key things about recording it is it needs to be in a format that's useful for all. So some of the demonstrator sites have developed a care and support planning template. Uh, I've certainly done some work with um, uh, sites that have to, to ensure that that is really person-centered as well as being compliant with whatever they need to. Other sites haven't gone down the route of developing a specific template um, and are just looking at what is useful to everybody. So it needs to be useful for the person, it needs to be useful for the practitioners and it needs to be useful for the commissioner. So it needs to contain information for all of those groups of people. At absolute minimum, it's got to have a summary of those kind of outcomes and decisions that have been made as part of the process. I think there's more to that. I think you need to have a sense of who somebody is, uh, but you can do that in quite simple formats, really. Um, where there is a budget, there needs to be clear budget sign-off. And because this work is, mainly, is part of a, a large program, um, it may be that in these early kind of iterations of um, of templates or um, recording methods that there's information collected that's for the evaluation of this piece of work. So um, that's an aside really, but at a minimum it needs to, to cover those things. Then we get on to making it happen, okay, um, which is obviously the implementation. And we start with, and I think it's really important that this is reflected in the care and support plan as well, what is it the person's going to do for themselves? So what is it that those self-management and self-care tasks that they can do for themselves so that this care and support plan isn't just focused totally on what specialist services need to do for somebody. So start with what the person can do for themselves. Then look at what support family and friends are providing. Then be looking at what universal services, so remember one of the key shifts is around, in that, a build, around building that kind of community and peer support that's routinely used. So both the, uni, the use of kind of universal services and voluntary and community sector are really important parts of implementing people's care and support plans and would show as a, bit, as a record in, in the care and support plan. 
Then it's thinking about what specialist health and social care services and potentially education services are needed, and also um, how the personal budget is being used or the use of the personal budget to implement aspect, the different outcomes and solutions in the care and support plan. So that's a different kind of shift in focus because often our care and support plans and the implementation of them is focused on the specialist services and what they provide without thinking about those other things first. So it's about a shift in mindset there really. And then the final thing is to think about review and ensuring that that's really person-centered. So what we'll be looking for is um, some of the process that, processes that we know that can really help. So starting, for an example, um, with um, what is working and what is not working and thinking about what people have tried, what people are pleased about, what they've tried, what they've learned, pleased about and concerned about. So going back to that kind of four plus one, the plus one being, and now what do we do differently? Um, checking people's aspirations again, so where do you want to be in the future? If people were talking about their aspirations for a year and they've completed those, so what's the next really? What are their priorities for change? So these obviously will have changed over a, a, a year if you're looking at a, a formal statutory review in a year's time. So it's going looking again at that working, not working, and then saying to the person, so what are your priorities for change? feeding in from practitioners thinking these are their priorities for change and then co-producing an agreement around that and then taking those and turning those into outcomes with creative solutions and actions um, and then looking at all the ideas and options to take that forward. So that's what the, the review um, would look like. Um, and then so that is our, our kind of care and support planning integrated process and that's the process that's being tested in uh, a number of sites uh, across the country as I said before. So just before I um, wrap up this, there are some things, that I, a couple of things I wanted to, to throw in to say that I know how are useful in this process, so things that I've learned specifically. Um, we want to make sure that um, the, a great integrated care and support plan has an essence of who somebody is. Uh, so we need to include that information about what matters to people. Um, my learning from many, many years of care and support planning now over um, about a 13 year period is that when I first started doing care and support planning, I used to um, probably spend about six pages uh, of a care and support plan writing about what matters to people, what's important to them, um, and sharing some of their history um, as well. And if I'm honest, I don't think decision makers are always reading that. The bit that they're most interested in is the outcomes, the contingency, the management of risk, and also um, how money is being spent, how the resources are being used in, in whatever way that's recorded. But I think if we're going to change culture and change mindsets, we've got to have uh, really clear information in, in place about who somebody is. So I think a really simple way to do that is to start a care and support plan with a one-page profile. It doesn't take six pages. It's on a page. Um, but it does give a great start straight away so that you can read somebody's the front page, a one-page profile, and you get that clear picture of who somebody is. Um, and I know this has been really, really popular with the sites that we've been working with um, and it is one of the things that's being put into the, this can be really helpful when we're looking at the framework being um, put forward by the Collaborative Development Group. Um, it's, a, it's a format that's useful because it's, a, it's something that can be taken from, almost um, taken a, take it separated from the care and support plan and a person can use that in a really simple way to stop having to repeat their story every time they meet a new professional. They can give them their one page profile rather than their whole care and support plan if that's not required. So it's, it's a useful tool. So that was just one of the, the tips that I have found um, is really important. Um, we have developed um, a, a process, a stepped process for developing outcomes. Um, used to be eight steps, just recently changed to seven, just to make life easier. But I find this really, in my head, helps me make sure that I am 
creating the most person-centered outcomes and I think that's a real challenge um, uh, in, in, in both health and social care I think as well actually um, it, within the Care Act we have eligibility outcomes um, but uh, having just uh, written a care and support plan for my own daughter around these, uh, maintaining a habitable home isn't an outcome that she would particularly talk about, but the two rooms she uses in the house, then being clean and tidy and knowing where everything is and everything's in its place and there's no food and plates and clothes all over the floor, actually that's her outcome. That wasn't a very detailed, that was a bit too long, that outcome, but that it's about making it more personal. So. This isn't a lengthy thing, this is just in your head taking these different steps and um, there is more detailed information on our group site um, around this, um, around the changes to, to this process and some detail. Um, you can, there's a video on YouTube with me talking to actually the old process but it's, it's still uh, relevant really. So I don't think you can develop outcomes if you don't know what matters to people and what their aspirations for the future are. I don't believe you can, that's step one. Uh, step two, I don't believe you can develop outcomes if you don't understand the context of somebody's life right now, which is what a working not working does. It's about co-producing priorities, so it's not about imposing, as practitioners imposing our priorities on people, it's co-producing them. That's when you start to develop outcomes. And actually I find by using um, a person-centered thinking tool called Important 2 and 4, you can drill down into the things that are really important to people as well as what we have to pay attention to in order for somebody to stay healthy and safe, make progress and fulfill their potential. You, that's step four. Step five is, a, is about checking out, have we got outcomes or have we got embedded solutions? Um, is it changing things that are, are working and not working for people or building on things that are working? Does it take people closer to their aspirations? What's getting in the way? Um, and then we develop our ideas and actions around that. So it's about thinking um, radically sometimes, and we use a tool called Radical, Traditional and Different. Um, around how do you uh, generate ideas to meet the outcomes that, that you have written at step four and checked out at step five, and then you record them. If you start with a blank, or you start with a template and take your template out to have a care and support planning conversation with somebody, you, you will not get the best outcomes. Uh, absolutely believe you will not get the best outcomes. You need to start with uh, a great conversation with people. I never take a template out with me, even if I know in the area where I'm doing some planning they use a template. I just take out a notebook or large pieces of paper depending on what you want to do. Um, and then I think one of the last things I just wanted to share was some just some thoughts about how you can set out outcomes really well. Now this would de be dependent on what's being used in your own local area in terms of a recording system. But just some ideas about things that I've learned over the last um, few years are that it's really important that we link uh, outcomes to areas of eligible need. And that's really important so that they don't look like they're random in some ways. Um, it's also useful, so column two you would describe uh, the outcome. Column two, uh, three and four are really useful as a way of almost a justification. So for a decision maker, it's being really clear about why, what's getting in the way of the, achieving this now. So what's that reason why this isn't happening and what the risk is if you don't achieve it. And that's really important, I think, in terms of justification. It's then looking at the creative solutions for achieving it and recording those. And then it's thinking about what's the risk. So risk is really important that we, we tackle risk, but rather than taking a broad approach to risk, it's thinking about how do we manage um, the risk in terms of the solutions that people want um, to, to use. And then it's about costs. So that's just some thoughts around outcomes. Um, that's all that I wanted to share. There's some details there. My email address is there and all the details of our website, Facebook, uh, Twitter and YouTube. If you have any specific questions when you listen to this, um, please do um, send me an email or uh, direct message me on the group site and I uh, look forward to hearing from you and I hope that we, um, I can answer your questions. Thank you very much.